In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, me and the crew, we are going to recap last week's G League Fall Invitational, where Ron Holland, Matas, Matas Fazulas, and Alexander Saar were on display in front of the NBA scouts, and we may have a new player that should be in the discussion to be the number one pick. I think he's in the discussion, but we'll see if Richard and Leaf agree. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Lock On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That is J-A-S-E medical.com. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And my co-host for today, I got the whole crew with me. Above me, to my left, it may look different on your screen if you're watching on YouTube. We have Leaf Tuling, the guy that watches more college basketball than anyone else. So you got about a month and some change, maybe? I need maybe it, Maybe a man. month and a half? I need it back. <laughs> Before college basketball starts. And then we got Mr. Mav Draft, Richard Stamen, but he's wearing an Indiana Pacers shirt. Is it Tyrese Halliburton or Matherin? Matherin. I also have a, a Kendall Brown Pacers one, and everyone asks if it, if Brown is my last name. Yeah, because <laughs> nobody mean, I, knows. That's what I would I would assume. I'd assume you got that personalized. Because where do you find a Kendall Brown <laughs> shirt at? Anyway, that's another subject. I know you were pretty high on Kendall Brown last year. All right, let's talk about the G League Fall Invitational. I was there in, in Las Vegas, and I have I did a recap and wrote an article on it. But I want to hear your thoughts. And I'll start with you, Leaf. Who was the player that stood out to you the most or caught you by surprise in the two games between the G League Ignite and the Perth Wildcats from the NBL in Australia? I think there are some obvious contenders that that people will be like, okay, well, this is who you're keying into, but I'll just go with the guy that I think is the best player in the class, and that's Ron Holland. I, I watched that game, and I, I've, I've been open about this with you guys and a little bit to the audience as well. As I, I don't watch too much high school tape. I'll watch a bit when I have time, and I'll watch a high school tape after I watch them play college basketball and see if I'm missing anything that like maybe they'll incorporate based off situations. So I knew of him. I'd watched highlights, but I hadn't watched full games. And I watched him play. And you can just see to me the the difference. And I think there's a level of difference between he and Buzelis. Yeah. And so that's what really struck me is when you were you know, when we were in Chicago, we we saw Matos Buzelis, and everyone's like, oh, potential number one pick. And that's all fine and well. And this is not necessarily the number one, but I think there's a level of of like a tier level already between those two players. And Holland's competitive nature, his his spark, his first step, his more well-rounded game all all stuck out to me. And this is the first um, professional action. I, I think that people are going to have growing pains. I think Matas Bezelis' first game was pretty ugly, quite frankly. And Ron Holland's, you know, there's regression to the mean, both positively and negatively. But just you, you can't teach some of the things, the traits that I witnessed him like put forth in the first game. And he, he had a good first step. He was able to score from all three levels. And, and I think that his tenacity is just something that I won't be able to unsee. I think I, I bet he goes wire to wire for me as number one pick. What about you, Richard? Yeah, I, I completely echo everything we've said. He's my number one guy. Uh, I mean, 33 points in the second game. Um, I'm blanking on what he had in the first one. I think it was something like 19, something like that. 23. Maybe 20. It was 23, 23. Yeah. And everything looked smooth. Three level score. The body control, I think he's going to draw a lot of fouls because of it. Uh, there was a play in transition where the guy was parked in front of him, and it should have been both guys fell kind of thing, and he just absorbs it, puts the shot up, gets the shooting foul. And I, I really think he's going to get a lot of fouls drawn because he's so quick for his size. He has long arms. He has good touch at the rim. That combination is going to get him a lot of shooting ability, or sorry, free throws just from that slashing, and then he's going to finish at the rim. He clearly has a mid-range and off-the-dribble game. He had a nasty step-back jumper in game one. I just I couldn't find many flaws. The only thing was 
you know, he played a little bit sped up to start the game, but kind of like Leaf said, it was pretty quick. He separated him, him, himself from like guys like Matas, who's also in the number one contention at this point. They have a totally different take. Now, I think NBA scouts would want Matas or Matas to be the number one pick just because he's he's taller, he's longer. You can make a case and say he's more skilled. He's a better shooter. But what he doesn't have is what Ron has, and that is tenacity, alpha mentality. Ron is a dog. And Ron, no matter what, if his shot's not falling, he's going to make an impact on the game just with his athleticism and energy. And what I like about Ron that makes him so appealing on one hand is because, well, one, he's not 6'8". They got him listed at 6'8". He's about 6'6". I wouldn't even be surprised if at the combine he measures at like 6'5 and three quarters which I guess next year he'll have to actually participate because if he's like the top pick in past drafts, he probably wouldn't even have to do anything. But Ron is transitioning from being a four on the prep level to a wing on the professional level. And despite the fact that the handle is not like super tight, even though he made some jump shots, I'm not 100% sold on him as a jump shooter yet. He still went out and averaged 28 points per game in two games while there's still like flaws in his game, like you said, he was sped up. I thought that he made a couple nice passes, but there was times that he he forced it a little bit. But still, he got to the free throw line 20 times in, in two games. He just impacts games in so many ways. And so if you're looking at it from like a scout's perspective and you say, all right, if this guy went out and averaged 28 points per game over two games and – You know, the ball handling isn't crisp all the way. The decision making isn't there all the way. The shot and you look and say, all right, we can just hone that in. This guy's going to have a major, major impact on games. And on the flip side with Buzelis, it's weird because if you just look at the box stats, the box score, it looks like he played well. He averaged like 16 and a half points. He shot the ball efficiently by numbers but there was just long stretches where he had like no impact in my opinion so we'll start with you Richard what was your thoughts on Buzelis over the two games yeah I I think in the first quarter my notes that I wrote for the first game was he just completely disappeared like I I was watching him and nothing was happening uh to be specific I'll, I'll actually pull up my notes and see so I put lack of assertiveness and aggression is very notable early on and I thought it was just kind of one of those things where he was content being the off ball guy. He wasn't trying to get the ball, but then the game sped up or sorry, the game went on and he kind of caught pace with the game, right? It was a fast game. He figured it out. He adjusted what you want to see. You want to see adjustments and things like that on the fly. And with Matas, that's what he did. He had uh, multiple possessions in a row where he was drawing fouls, getting to the rim. There was a lot to like. I mean, there was three level scoring. It was I like face up mid range jumpers. There was a behind the back that he got to get an and one. He had a spot up three moving back kind of off a of relocation, almost fake cut relocate to the back uh, or to the corner. I mean, and that stuff was really impressive. Like as an off ball player with a little bit of on ball flash, that's exactly what we wanted to see. Now, was it number one worthy? Probably not, but he still has solidified himself, I think, as somebody that clearly has a role as a scorer in this league with his size. Yeah. What about you, Leaf? Uh, I would say typically a number one pick for, for better or worse, they have an impact and they're noticeable for just like the attributes they have, the differentiating factors that you think ha- like that could lead to star power. I'll use an example. And this is a bit extreme because obviously he's turned out to be very good, but Anthony Edwards was not particularly good at Georgia. Like if you were to look at the impact on winning, if you were to look at just efficiency, uh, shot selection, a lot of stuff, but you knew he had differentiating traits that that you were like, okay, this guy has it. The Michigan State game at the Maui Invitation. (laughs) Little 37-piece step back right uh, over Cassius Winston. I I remember that. Um, But my my point being, and that's extreme because he's obviously a tremendous physical talent, but that's typically what differentiates players like Paolo Bancaro, for instance, like Raphael and I, I had this discussion last year 
it was like, okay, when you're picking someone to be your number one, you want them to have the capacity to be your lead scorer and lead you to the promised land. I didn't see that with Jabari Smith. I, I feel the same way about Matos Buzelis as I do about Jabari Smith. And I, I'd honestly feel more confident in Jabari Smith because his traits uh, as a shooter and a defender, I, I think are, are really good. Buzelis to me doesn't uh, like scream, this is the guy you want the ball in the hands of. He looks slow to me. Like, I don't know if this is, I, I wasn't there. I was watching this on Synergy. Uh, but like he looked like the the athleticism, the maturity of the op- opposition overwhelmed him at times. And that's something that I never want to see uh, from someone I want to turn the keys over to my franchise. So this may come off very harshly. I think he's still going to be a highly picked player. But if I'm looking at this from the view of I don't know who's going to be number one, I haven't watched actual film of either of these players other than highlights. And I wanted to see who was going to stand out. He was third or fourth on the list of players that stood out to me. Yeah, I agree. All right, when we return, I want to talk a little bit more about Buzelis. I want to talk about Alexander Saar, who I thought was the big breakout star of the G League Fall Invitational. And then I want to talk about Ifan Almanza, who I've turned a corner and I've become a believer. But let's talk about Jace Medical. It is a new sponsor. And Jace Case, the Jace Case, provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get a Jace case is fill out a simple online form and in some cases jump on a quick call with with one of our board certified physicians. Get ongoing care from our physicians on any treatment related questions. Doctor created, doctor recommended. So do not get caught unprepared. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. And Jace handles everything from online evaluations to licensed pharmacy medication delivery ongoing consultation and care. So if you are looking to get care, go get a Jace case. You can save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical, plus an additional $20 off by using my code locked on L-O-C-K-E-D at checkout at jacemedical.com. That is J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. And we are getting closer and closer and closer to basketball season. And I was excited about this G League showcase because we were able to actually talk about a basketball game that we watched outside of the World Cup. And this is what we're here on this episode. So I wanted to finish up on Buzelis. And so I'm touching on what Richard said. Like in my notes, I have in the first 1.5 quarters of the first game, he made absolutely no impact. There was there was a play where I thought he made like an aggressive post-up move on a smaller guard. He missed the shot, but you could just see like the footwork and and I mean the talent is evident. But then there was a play or two plays that I remember where he went up against Sar and he went up kind of weak and he got both of his shots blocked. And then just being there, and I didn't have like a box score until after the game was over. I saw that he made some nice plays in the fourth quarter. The game was the side. I think he hit two threes in the second half. And I think they were actually like late second half. And then I look at the box score, and I think he finished with like 14 points or or maybe 17 points. And it was like, you know, you go on social media and you see the highlights, and then you see like, you know, like um, on the Ignite page. And it was like, I didn't think that he had any impact on the game. And then I watched, I was there for the second game also, and I thought he had some moments, but he left me like wanting more. Like I feel like with with his talent and his skill set, I think that if he put it together and if he had a different like alpha dog mentality, I think he's the one guy that could be a clear cut number one if there was a mentality change. What are your thoughts on that? And I'll start with you, Richard. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I completely agree. He's a guy where I, I, to me, I think he knows he needs to add a strength and it shows like he was very contact averse, uh, things like that. He The angles he takes even like this is a double edged sword. He loves driving the baseline like he he loves those corner ISOs so he can go anywhere he wants. And he, it's a good and bad thing because I think he he loves to go left onto the baseline or right, whichever side he's on. 
and he can make a lot of plays. He's very good at it. But also going to the middle would require, you know, you're going to get all the defense. You're going to have to finish. You're going to have to take the bump. And he just doesn't do that. It's a double-edged sword. I think it's a great ability he has right now where he can go corner. He can drive and kick. He can do whatever he wants. But kind of like you said, can he do it all consistently and have that killer mentality? That's something we're going to have to watch for the rest of the year. Yeah, and I was actually at the practice on Thursday between games. And Coach Hart, if you if you didn't get a chance to listen to the interview I had with Gila Goodnight, head coach Jason Hart, check it out. I thought it was one of the better interviews. He was pretty candid and open about all the players on the roster. And one of the things that they worked on in practice was making sure that when 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 he when Maras got the ball in the corner, that he was being aggressive and attacking. They didn't want him just settling for for threes, especially if teams already know that he could shoot. So they're they're going to close out on him. But that was like a, a big point of emphasis was when you catch the ball in the corner, be a threat, be a threat to attack the rim. Overall, Leaf, how, if you had to give him a grade, like what would your grade be for, for Madas Bazoulas in the two games? As just watching basketball, I would be less critical uh, watching the watching with the expectation of this guy could be number one. I can't unsee how I thought about that. So in general, I, I felt like he played a fine game. He didn't have much of an impact, like you mentioned, for a quarter and a half. And then he, I, I felt like the when, when he played his best in the first game, it didn't matter. And that's not necessarily his fault. Um, it's just something that I take, uh, I take stock into. Um, so I, I'd give him about a C the first game. And then the second game, probably a B. Maybe a yeah, I'd, I'd say a B. I, I I think it's hard to anticipate, you know, for an eighteen year old to thrive. But that's what you uh, fairly or unfairly that's what you expect. Like you saw Scoot Henderson against Wen Benyama last year in this exact showcase, and for the first half there was a question: who, Could he go above Wen Benyama? Mm -hmm. Like he was that spectacular. I'm not saying that these guys are like considered parallels, but Scoot Henderson went number three, right or wrong. Like I had him as the second best player. But these guys don't look even in the same category to me yeah. as Scoot Henderson or Buzelis doesn't in Holland, not quite there either, in my opinion. But at least like you can see that, like you can see there's a possibility for him to to be handed the keys to a franchise. And you're like, OK, I, I believe in that. I, I just don't see it for for Buzelis based on what I've seen so far. Yeah, I talked to some scouts there and they were one scout was like, why are we even here? He was so anti <laughs> going to the event. But other scouts and agents that I talked to felt like both guys are probably going to be complementary players in the NBA. They didn't see like star franchise power, but teams based off of what I spoke to, who I spoke with felt more comfortable with Ron having a very big impact as the guy that you can put next to your star and he can impact the game in two different ways while they were pretty, I wouldn't say critical, but they were concerned about Bazoulas as, is he even like a second option? Like they seemed like they were hinting at this guy, despite how talented he is, could be comfortable being the third or fourth option because he's just really not aggressive. And then they were just kind of concerned at how, I mean, Perth was just kind of picking at him on, on the defensive end. Like he was struggling, defending, off the dribble and then just the physicality was what was a I mean it was just a step up for him but now the next player that I want to talk about is somebody that I think should be in the discussion to go number one because if we in the preseason had talked about Alexander Saar as a potential number two pick or number one pick and we build this showcase as Holland versus Saar then I think we would have been very pleased because Alexander Saar showed me something and I had been critical of him over the past few months. And, and I never was critical about the talent. I've said from day one that he has the talent to be one of the best players in the draft. 7'1", seven, 7'5", seven, wingspan. He's athletic. He can shoot. He can handle. I mean, he's like the, the perfect blend of athleticism and skill set that you're looking for for modern day big. But he was someone that I was just really concerned about because I had never seen him dominate for like back-to-back -back games. And even if you look at his stats from overtime elite, 
He averaged like 11 points per game. Um, I mean, didn't put up huge numbers there, 11.6 rebounds per game. And then it was even worse this summer playing on the French national team at the under 19. He only averaged seven points and six rebounds per game. I had him at number 30 on my board. But after last week, I'm, I mean, I haven't come up with a new board yet, but I'm going to put him ahead of Maras just because with his size and athleticism, the shot blocking, he averaged six blocks per game. And some of those blocks were emphatic blocks, like sending them to, I don't want to call them the cheap seats because they're normally <laughs> expensive, but they were pretty cheap for this event. But I mean, he was blocking shots that were like landing not too far from executives. And he showed just a different level of like competitive fire that I hadn't seen from him. I mean, he was like talking trash and staring guys down. I know some people don't like that, but for a guy when you want to be like your your dog, that's something that I think is an encouraging sign. So I'll start off with you, Leaf. Around what rank did you have Sar and what were your impressions of him after this showcase? Uh, I came in with with very little expectation for any players on this. Like I, I knew who was considered to be rated in the in the vague ranges that you know all companies put out in their mock drafts and their big boards. But I came in with as much, I mean, this is just going to, this is just for Richard, but with a tabula rasa and uh, a blank slate for everyone. And I just wanted to see Richard laugh, but, um, but uh, I really did come in with a blank slate. And so he exceeded all my expectations, Richard, good Lord. Um, this is this. So basically my point, my point would be that I, I expected him to be athletic and I expected him to have energy impact, but he had that along with the skill that puts him like if you were to compare him to a, play, a prospect from last cycle, you would have said like preseason Kalel Ware is like the most similar, mm-hmm. I think the hype wise, but he had the energy, the aggression, the physicality, and then the skill to boot that Ware lacked three of the four of. And so I, I think that Sar likely regresses to a mean at some point and like he performed very well and, and, and helps his stock enormously by the first real a chance for people to see him like evaluators like us are going to have this in our back of our minds for the entirety of the year. Um, So I I think he probably goes top 10. I don't know if he slides into the top five. Like, like you said, he's ahead of Buzelis. I I would, I'd probably put him comfortably at like five or six, but so far I'm, I I need to see some college players before I really establish a top, you know, five, six, but I think talent wise, he's in there. Yep. All right. When we return, I want to get Richard's take, but let's talk about FanDuel. The NFL season has already started, and right now, if you are a new customer, you can get an incredible deal from FanDuel. New customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets, guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off the NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you would not want to miss. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL and locked on. All right, last segment, we left off talking about Alexander Saar, and I wanted to get your thoughts on his performance, Richard. Yeah, I really liked what I saw from him. Uh, kind of like you left off, left let the uh, last segment off with, you know, the the defense, the shot blocking. Like I, I felt his instincts were fantastic. The timing was fantastic. The athleticism, the length, the size, the mobility. I mean, he's going to be able to guard every position. It almost reminds me of like just defensively the way Isaiah Jackson a couple years ago moved, like just the physical tools. I think he's more polished than yeah. than Isaiah Jackson, so it's a little bit different. But just on the defensive end, you look at the tools and just imagine what can be, and it's not that far from it. That's the big difference, like between them. But I just, I really was impressed. And then on top of that, like he just showcased everything. He had, he was comfortable in every element. The balls in his hands, he created a little bit. There were times he tried finding his teammates, and you know he had some turnover issues. But I think overall, he still saw the game well. He saw the floor well. He knew what the right play was with the ball in his hands. He was making good defensive plays. He crashed the boards. I mean, you know this. The the putback dunks were just so many of them, and, and he, they were emphatic. So he's going to crash the boards. 
I really think there's upside as a shooter. The free throw form looks good. The jump shot form looks fine. I honestly haven't been able to like dissect that, but I really think he's somebody from three. Yeah, exactly. Like he, there was nothing he didn't do, and he did just about everything well. So to me, I think he's the biggest riser from the event. Ron Holland, like it's different because he was already kind of the number one guy. He's in a different place for it. But I really do think he's somebody now that we're going to look at ahead of when the pre college draft boards start dropping in a month and a half all across the board. I think you're going to see Alex Star top five and yeah. rightfully so. And I mean, he was impressive. And like I've said, I. I'm not surprised that his talent was on full display because he's, I mean, he's just one of the more talented big men that we've had come out in years. I was just that, I was just surprised that the consistency over two games, which he dominated, which, like I said, on the defensive end, he was blocking shots. And to me, the most impressive play wasn't actually a block. It was a play where he had Ron, in like isolation and Ron couldn't get by him and Ron blows by everybody. And one of the things about Ron that I, I didn't factor in, you know, the years I've been watching him is that with a bigger court and spacing, his first step is even more incredible. And it's just being there. I sat courtside the first game, Ron's first step is incredible. And he struggled on one possession, not saying it was all the time, but there was one possession where Saar, bottled him up he couldn't get by him and ron gave him i mean he gave him all he had <laughs> as far as the shake and bake moves and sorry matched him step for step and forced ron to pass the ball away and it was at the end of the shot clock i believe so that was probably the most impressive defensive play that i saw from sar but i actually interviewed him and i was asking him you know what was the difference and he casually mentioned that He's actually been featured. He said he never was featured in France and he wasn't really featured at OTE. So with him being featured in Australia, it's basically unlocked the skill set that he felt like he's already had. And then I mentioned to him that, you know, I was a little disappointed with the seven points per game at the U19s. But then Bilal Koulibaly averaged like seven points the year before at the U19s and then went up into what was he, the seventh pick. So it's almost like it is kind of knock that I've talked about on, on French prospects in a sense. And maybe it's just the system that doesn't want guys to like dominate and put up big numbers. And they're playing this, this brand of basketball, which I mean, we've seen it work in Europe where, where guys are, I mean, it's like equal opportunity. I mean, what's Leaf's word? Ego, e- egalitarian. <laughs> egalitarian. <laughs> egalitarian offense. But it's actually holding guys back. So, um, but yeah, I was impressed. And I, I, I mean, I would put him a, a ahead of Manas right now. All right, the next prospect that I want to talk about is Ethan Almanza. He is someone that, I, I know some people had him in the top 10. I know you had him pretty high, Richard. And I was kind of wrestling in my mind where to have him. I think I put him at number 15 on my board. And I was just more so picking him apart because, you know, he's not like a great athlete. He's not a floor spacer. I knew the resume was crazy impressive, winning three MVPs in, in, in two summers at the U-17s, 18s, and u 19 So I knew he had like the most incredible international resume. But I couldn't put him into a box as what he does well outside of score as a role man. But when he came into the games, the energy just shifted. And if you pair him with a good point guard, and I thought it was very wise of Coach Hart to play uh, Almanza's minutes with with Jeremy Pargo because Jeremy was able to find him on the rolls. And so he's someone that if I had to, you know, put like a little grade as far as stock up, stock down, even though the college players haven't played, I'd say that his stock went up in my opinion, just based off of his performance. And then I have a comparison, Joakim Noah. That is my comparison. So what were your thoughts on him? I'll start with, I'll start with you, Leaf. Uh, I liked what he brought to the table. I think you put it, put it well that he's an energy guy. Uh, he feels like a glue guy. I know it's a t- term usually used for yeah. like the NBA playoff teams, the teams that, like, you know, when they need they need a player, they've got four that everyone talks about, and all of a sudden this fifth player is really what elevates them. Uh, like, Kevon Looney is a great example of, like, when everyone starts preaching about a player like Kevon Looney, it means that they're really doing a subtle job all year, and you just only notice when it's big moments. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, I kind of think he's that type of player. So it's harder to get excited about the potential, but I think the impact is really positive. And so it depends the team that's drafting. Some teams draft for uh, prioritizing culture and some prioritize potential. And I think if he goes to a team that prioritizes culture, I think he's got a uh, untapped potential that could be really like better than people imagine. I just don't think he's going to like astronomically blow anyone's brains with, with like the physical traits. Like you mentioned, he's not a stellar athlete. He just makes the right basketball plays and seems to have the intangibles in, in, in troves. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Richard? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Actually, Leaf, I took half the words out of my mouth. I was going to say one of the things with him is, you know, he, he doesn't need to drop, 10 points, 10 rebounds, five assists, two blocks, two steals to have like a big impact on the game. He's unique in that regard. I think he's somebody where you're going to watch the game and go, wow, he was good. And then you're going to look and he's going to get five points, seven rebounds, three assists, a block and a steal. And you're going to go, that's really like, it's almost in the way, uh, I I like the Noah one. If Noah didn't have the ugliest free throw form uh, we've ever seen, but like there's, you know, there's real jump, jump shooting upside. That's a big difference, but there are a lot of similarities. I think you you look at just watch him in the pick and roll, right? As a role man, he's somebody that he is going to be able to see the next play. Is it finish? Is it with his quick, you know, push shot floater? Is it make the pass to the cutter, to the corner? Whatever it is, he's a great decision maker. And it almost reminds me, I'll, this is not, a, again, this is not like a one-to-one for me, but the same way Draymond impacts the game. It, Almanza has a lot of those similarities of how he does it, where, again, Draymond Green is not somebody known for lighting up the stat sheet, kind of in rebounds and assists, but elsewhere, you look at the scoring, even the defense, he's one of the greatest defenders, if not the greatest defender of our generation. In a lot of games, he ends up with one block, one steal, and he's played lights out defense. And kind of like we said, you look at Looney, uh, somebody else who he's doing the dirty work. That's what Almonza is going to do. And I, I really think he's going to get hurt by it on draft night, but also helped by it because like we've said, he'll probably go somewhere that has a more established culture because of it. Yeah, when I was talking to Coach Hart and I was basically telling him my thoughts, I was like, you know, and I look at him like he's not a five, he's not strong enough to be a five. He was like, he's only 18. He's not going to be 18 forever. And so you have to factor that in, which is true. But I just like the impact that he makes. And like you said, I, and, and I never thought about the Draymond comparison, but just the way that he makes things happen when he's in the game as far as like the rebounding, the tap outs, which don't even count as rebounds, like the extra possessions. And even on like dribble handoffs, like he, even when he has the ball, he's like aggressively going into his dribble handoffs where he's setting good screens, which is allowing the guard to get downhill. And then once he gets the ball around the paint, I mean, he has really incredible touch around the rim at like weird angles and just watching him practice some of the shots it's very unorthodox. I mean, it's like sometimes it's a hook shot, sometimes it's a push shot. And I mean, he was just making just these really weird shots off the glass from different angles. And I mean, he is very efficient around the rim once he gets the ball in the paint. So he is someone that I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit higher on after watching him play two exhibition games than I was before. But I think for me, it was watching him in person and, and seeing what he does. Now I am curious to see like if they put him in that starting lineup with London Johnson, how different would it be? Because Pargo made it his, I mean, he made it his emphasis to find Ethan on the roll and get him going. While I thought with the starting group, he, he, he wouldn't get some of those easy reads. So that's something I'm going to be looking out for throughout the season. Well, that wraps up this episode It's great to have, the big three on and we're, we're going to do this a lot more often this season. Thank you, the listener for making the locked on NBA big board podcast, your first listen of the day. And I got some interviews from, from the, the G league fall invitational that I'm going to upload. So be on the lookout for those. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tulane and Richard Stamen. And we are 